Sing the praises of the Lord. Oh, rise and mangas. Let the praises of the Lord. Oh, rise and mangas. Let the praises of the King. Oh, rise and mangas. Let it rise. Oh, let the praises of the Lord. Oh! 
share something my wife shared with me this morning that God showed her about Argentina made her think of the Israelites in Egypt and how God allowed them to have a hard taskmaster he allowed everything that happened where they were only to create a cry that they would be ready when the time came so this morning I would like us to let the Lord pray through you and pray through me Lord you know what prayers you want answered you know what you want to do in Argentina the people there. So Lord, we come before you and give you thanks for your mercy, for your grace. And as we send our pastors once again to that land, oh God, the land that has blessed us, blessed me. Lord, we ask for strength for Pastor John, Peachy, for healing in, in their bodies, strength for that which is before them. And that they would speak forth, whether it's in private or before a huge congregation or a small group, it would be your words, words of life, healing deliverance anoint them with a fresh new anointing upon their lives for in their weakness Lord you shall show yourself strong it's not our abilities but yours so Lord we just ask oh God for them and for the land of Argentina, for Buenos Aires, Cordoba, and wherever else you might send him, but even the whole land, because one will set the other on fire, Lord. And this time, may that cry come forth from their hearts. May that cry arise before you, and you shall hear that cry, and you shall answer that cry. And all that long-awaited deliverance is coming. It's coming, Lord. Lord, may this be that time. Lord, light, 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 abundant light in that land, abundant light unto your children, abundant light and mercy and grace, oh God. Rise up, 
oh Lord. Rise up on their behalf, oh God. For you are the mighty God. You are the mighty God. You are the captain of the host. And your name is Jesus. And you shall go before them and be behind them, oh God. I give you praise. I give you praise. Magnify. Magnify thy name. O oh Lord, rise up this generation, O oh God. Rise up, O oh Lord, and bring forth mighty, mighty, mighty soldiers, O oh God, that are obedient unto you, that are willing, O oh Lord. Lord, speak to their hearts. Call them unto yourself. Unveil yourself. Unveil your love. Unveil your person unto them in this hour, O oh God. Every eye shall behold, every eye shall see and behold their Lord, their God, their Savior. In this hour, Lord, we ask, oh God, have mercy, have mercy, oh Lord. And that which you have purposed for this time and this generation shall be accomplished in that land, accomplished in those cities, oh God. And you shall set their hearts aflame, or set them aflame, oh Lord, oh Lord. That it would set others on flame, oh God. That that fire would go out throughout that land, oh God. From the north to the south, from the east to the west, oh God. Almighty God, you reign and rule over the land of Argentina. All your plans and purposes, oh God, are holy, are right, are good. We give you thanks, oh God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We praise, we bless your name. We bless your name. Every prayer that comes from you shall be accomplished. Every word that comes and proceeds out of your mouth shall be accomplished. Thank you, Lord. So kind, so generous, so merciful. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. You know, you know, you know, you know, oh, Lord. And there is nothing that you cannot do. There's no stronghold that you cannot break, oh, Lord, over that land, over that people. I thank you, Lord. Call, call, call. Give them ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart that hears you and is quick to obey. Oh, that they may hear that calling, that you're calling them unto yourself once again, oh God. That you're calling this generation, oh, and the inheritance of their fathers, their inheritance of their grandparents, oh God, is theirs that they'll take it up. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. May they pick it up and may they run with you may they walk with you hallelujah in jesus name we ask hallelujah jesus mm -hmm. good morning to everyone cal asked me to share today and for the past few days I've been preparing this word, and um, I believe it's uh, the word of God, and I believe that this is his word, so it's not my word. It is through a man by the name of Charles Spurgeon, uh, and we know about him because uh, sometimes, many times, Richard will read We'll start off the service with a little uh, thought from Charles Spurgeon. I came across a sermon that he did a few years, just a few years ago, 1859. So even though this is years and years and years ago, it, 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 was, it spoke to me, and uh, I hope it speaks to you. And Lord, I pray that you would glorify your name through this message and that you would speak to us. I pray that in the name of Jesus. The, the message, the, the scripture, the main scripture is out of Romans 7, 24 and 25. 
And it says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Apostle Paul is speaking, and some think he is speaking of what he was before his conversion. But I think not. It is Paul the Apostle, the mighty servant of God, the saint and apostle, who here exclaims, O oh, wretched man that I am. Humble Christians often think such men as Paul do not suffer as I do. They don't have to contend with the same evil passions that I contend with. Ah, if they knew their inner heart and thoughts, they would discover that the closer a saint lives to God, the more he mourns over his evil heart and the more he serves his master, the more the evil of his flesh vex and tease him day by day. We think this especially of the apostolic saints like St. Saint Paul, like St. John, thinking that they are more saints than any other of the saints of God, but they are all saints whom God has called by grace and sanctified by his spirit. But we put them in another list and look upon them as extraordinary saints who escape these passions like we have. But we forget the scripture that says Jesus was tempted in all points and the apostles being much inferior than Jesus would doubtless escape the temptations and passions that we also suffer. And if we met Paul, we would say, why Paul, your experiences are just like mine. You're more faithful, more holy, more deeply taught than I, but you're tempted with the same trials that I am and you are more deeply tried than I. They are not exempt from infirmity or sin and we should not regard them with that mystic reverence that makes us almost an idolater. Their holiness is attainable even by you. Their thoughts are to be censored as much as your own. Let us follow them, up to them and even beyond them. The same grace and light belongs to us. We should be comforted to know that we are in a fight in which the apostles themselves had to fight. Today, let us look at three things. First, the two natures. Second, the battle. And third, the fainting warrior who cries, O oh, wretched man that I am. After we will turn our eyes to another direction and we see the Christian who must get the victory and shout, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. First then, the two natures. Cardinal man inherited from Cardinal man inherited from parents and which since the transgression of Adam is evil and only evil and that continually. Mere human nature, such as is common to every man, may be honest, upright, and generous, have good thoughts from man to man. But when it comes to the matters of true religion, spiritual matters that concern God in eternity, the carnal mind can do nothing as it is fallen. It is at enmity with God and does not know God, nor can it ever know him. Now, when a man becomes a Christian, he is infused with a new nature. The Holy Spirit enters into him and, imp and implants a new nature, a new life. And that life is high and holy, supernatural life, is in fact the divine nature, a ray from the great Father of lights, God dwelling in man. The man becomes a double man, two men in one. Some have imagined that the old man is taken out of the new Christian. But not so, for the word of God and experience teach the contrary. The old nature is in the man, unchanged, unaltered, and as bad as it ever was. While the new nature is pure and holy, and hence there arises a conflict between the two. Note what the apostle says about these two natures, for I am about, I am about to contrast them. The apostle says the old nature is called the body of this death. What is this body? I think the Apostle Paul calls the evil nature within a body. 
And it is not a rag or a bone of evil that is left in the Christian. No, it is the whole body of sin that is left from the crown of the head to the sole of the foot. Grace does not maim this body. It leaves it entirely, although blessed be God, it crucifies it, nailing it to the cross. The new nature is a spirit, subtle, not easy to detect. And sometimes I have to question myself if it is there at all. But my old nature, that is a body, and I can never find it difficult to recognize its existence. It is apparent as my flesh and bone. Understand that the old nature is a body. It has substance, or as Calvin calls it, it is a mass of corruption. The whole of it is still there. It is crushed underfoot by grace and cast out of its throne, though. Why does he call it a body of death? Simply to show what an awful thing sin is that remains in the heart of man. It is a body of death. It was a custom of ancient tyrants when they wished to put men to the most fearful punishment, to tie a dead corpse on their back. There, back to back, the living would drag around the dead, rotting, putrid, corrupting, stench, carcass, wherever he went. This is just what the Christian has to do. He has a new life that the Holy Spirit has put within him. But he feels that every day he has to drag around the body of death, which is as loathsome as a rotting carcass is strapped to a living man. Someone made a picture one time of a great skeleton in which a man is encaged. It is death dwelling in the very temple of life. Did you ever think what an awful thing death is? The very thought is abhorrent to humanity. You say, I don't fear death. But it is so if you trust in Jesus and are looking for the glorious day of life coming. But death in itself is the most frightful thing. Inbred sin has all the gloom of death. A living soul condemned to walk through the black shades of confusion and to bear incarnate death in his bowels. Such is the life of a Christian. He has to daily battle with all the powers of sin, death, and hell. Consider the old man and the new man. Consider a 60-year-old man who is scarcely two years old in the Lord. Meditate on the warfare in the heart. It is a contest of an infant with a full-grown man. The wrestling of a babe with a giant. Old man Adam like a great oak has thrust his roots into the depths of manhood. Can the divine infant uproot him? From his birth, the new nature begins to struggle and continues until victory. But it is the moving of a mountain, the drying up of an ocean. Who can do these things? Well, the new heavenly nature will receive abundant help from its author, lest it yields and succumbs to the superior strength of its adversary and be crushed by its enormous weight. The old nature of man which remains in the Christian is evil and it can never be anything else but evil. For we are told in this chapter that in me, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. The old Adam nature cannot be improved. It is hopeless to attempt it. You cannot make the rebel into a friend or turn darkness into light. It is an enemy of God. On the contrary, the new life which God has given us cannot sin. In 1 John 3, 9, it says, The child of God sins not, because he is born of God. It is good. It knows nothing of sin. Its contact with sin brings it pain and misery. But the old nature is evil, and that continually. I have given you a little picture of these two natures. These two natures are essentially unchangeable. You cannot make the new nature less divine. And the old nature cannot make less impure and, and earthly. It is a leper's house, a garment spotted by the flesh. You can wash and wash and never clean. On the other hand, the new nature can never be tainted. It is spotless. It rules in our heart expecting the day when it will cast out its enemy. And without a rival, it shall be monarch in the heart of man forever. This describes the two combatants. Now, the battle. 
Never deadlier feud between two nations like between the two principles, right and wrong. But right and wrong are often divided by distance. And therefore they have less intense hatred. But suppose right is for liberty and wrong for slavery. We should not so intensely hate slavery as if it was right in front of our eyes. Where we see a slave owner whip a slave until his blood flowed bright red. Our blood would boil over with intense indignation of the wrong. It is distance which makes us forget and hate less. The right forgets the wrong because it is far away. But suppose now that right and wrong lived in the same house. Suppose the two are compelled to live together in a narrow house called man. The evil thing says, I I'll turn you out, you intruder. Out with you. I have no peace with you. I cannot riot as I would. Indulge in lust as I would. I will not be content until I slay you. No, says the newborn nature. I will kill you and drive you out. I will not allow stick or stone of you to remain. I have taken sword out and will never rest till I get victory over you until I totally eject you from this house of mine. They were never friends and never can be. The evil must hate the good and vice versa. Think of the wolf and the lamb. You might think the newborn nature is like the lamb, but it is not. Because of the omnipotence of God about it. And the evil has all the strength of the evil one, though we frequently underestimate it. Even if quiet, they both hate each other nonetheless. The one cannot endure the other. There are times when the old nature is very active and all its deadly weapons will fly against you. You might be attacked with anger. And when you guard yourself against a hot temper, pride rises. And you, and you start saying, oh, I'm, I am, am I not a good man to keep my temper down? When you squish pride down, suddenly lust peeks out of the window of your eyes to look upon a thing you shouldn't desire upon. And when you throw down the lust, sloth surrounds you and you cease from the Lord's work. And when you attempt to arouse yourself, you've awakened pride again. Evil haunts you where you go. On the other hand, by means of grace, the newborn nature will employ love, prayer, Faith, hope, promises, and providence to cast out the evil. Well, says one, I don't find it so. Then I am afraid for you. If you don't hate sin enough to do everything to drive it out, I'm afraid you're not a child of God. A child of the living God. It's one thing to hear about the evil of the heart, but unless you hate that evil, unless you seek to drive it out, you're yet in your sin. Men who only believe in their depravity but do not hate it are no further than the devil on the road to heaven. That I hate my corruption proves that I'm a Christian, a living child of God. These two natures will never cease to struggle as long as we are in this world. The old nature will never give up. It will always strike as often as it can. Remember the battle of Christian with Apollyon, Apollyon lasted three hours. But the battle of Christian with himself lasts all the way from the wicked gate to the river Jordan. The enemy within can never be driven out while we are here. The old Adam will be with us from first even to the last. Till that moment when we shall leave our bones in the grave, our fears in the Jordan, and our sins in oblivion. Both natures will never cease to bring in allies to the fight. The evil nature has old relations and sends out messengers seeking help. Like Cador Lamer, king of Elam, it brings other kings with it when it goes out to battle. Ah, says old Adam, I have friends from the pit, and from the pit they come. The flesh also has friends in the world like the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. What a battle when sin, Satan, and the world assail the Christian. Ah, says one, it is a terrible thing to be a Christian. It is. 
It is one of the hardest things in the world to be a Christian. In fact, it is impossible unless the Lord makes us his children and keeps us so. Well, what does the new nature do? When it sees all these enemies, it cries out to the Lord. And the Lord sends out help, beginning with Jehovah, in the everlasting counsel and reveals to the heart its own interest in the secrets of eternity. Then comes Jesus with his blood, and he says, I'll make you more than a conqueror through my death. And then appears the Holy Spirit, the comforter. With such assistance, this newborn nature is more than a match for its enemies. Sometimes God leaves the new nature alone, and it, lets its, and it let it know its own weakness. But not for long, lest it sink in despair. Are you fighting with the enemy today, my dear Christian brother? Are Satan, the flesh, and the world, that hellish trinity all against you? Remember, there's a divine trinity that is for you. Fight on, fight on for with you as God, and you shall overcome. The conflict is hard to describe, but surely you can guess, for you perhaps have felt the same. God with man against man, the world, and hell. What a battle, what a fight. Now the fainting warrior. We notice the weary combatant. He lifts up his voice and weeping, he cries, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He will not give up the conflict, though the battle is furious. It's the cry of one who is fainting. His strength is failing and he feels that without God he is defeated. And he repeats, Oh, wretched man that I am. And then he asks, Who shall deliver me? The law answers, I cannot and will not. Conscience says, I can make you see the battle, but I cannot help you. And the old human nature says, none can deliver you, and I shall destroy you, and the house of David shall be destroyed, but the house of Saul shall live and reign forever. And the poor Christian soldier cries again, who shall deliver me? And it seems hopeless, and sometimes I think the true Christian may think he is hopeless, hopelessly given over to the power of sin. The wretchedness, the wretchedness, wretchedness of Paul is in two things. He believed in the doctrine of human responsibility, and yet he felt the doctrine of human inability. I've heard people say sometimes, well, you tell the sinner that he cannot believe and repent without the help of the Holy Spirit. But yet you tell him that it is his duty to believe and repent. How are these two to be reconciled? We reply, they do not want any reconciliation. They are two truths of Holy Scripture, and we leave them to reconcile themselves. I know it is my duty to be perfect, but I am conscious that I cannot be. I know that every time I commit sin, I am guilty, and yet I am certain I must sin, for my nature is such that I cannot help it. I feel that I am unable to get rid of this body of death, yet I know I ought to get rid of it. These two things are enough to make any man miserable, to know that he is responsible for sinful nature, and yet to know that he cannot get rid of it. To know that it is his business to keep God's law perfectly and to walk in the commandments of the law blamelessly, and yet to know by sad experience that he is not able to do so. The way some men deny this dilemma is the denial of one of these truths. They say, well, it is true that I am unable to cease from sin, and then they deny their obligation to do so. They do not cry, oh, wretched man that I am. And they live as they like and say that they cannot help it. On the other hand, there are men who know they are responsible, but they say, well, I can cast off my sin. But the man who believes these two doctrines as taught in God's word that he is responsible for sin, for sin, and yet knows he is unable to get rid of it. When he looks into himself, he cries in despair, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And now, says one, I would not be a Christian if that is the way. If he's always fighting with himself, and even until he despairs of victory, stop a moment. Let us complete the picture. This man is fainting, but he will be restored by and by 
Think not that he is hopelessly defeated. He falls to rise. He faints to be revived afresh. Sound the promise in his ear and see how he soon revives. Put the cordial to his lips and see how he starts up and plays the man again. I have almost been defeated, he says, almost driven to despair, but rejoice not against me, O mine enemies. Though I fall, I shall rise. I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. And he goes again more than a conqueror through him that has loved him. The last point. The Christian is to be a conqueror at last. Do you think that we are forever to be a slave of sin? Forever to be a slave of my own nature? Am I always to have this dead man strapped to my back? No, no, no. That which is in my heart is like a caged eagle. And I know that soon the bars that confine me shall be broken, the door of my cave shall be open, and I shall mount with my eye upon the sun of glories, soaring upward till I reach God's eternal love. No, we that love the Lord are not forever to sojourn in Meshach, to dwell in the tents of Kedar. We shall not be so forever. The day will come when we shall rise and shake ourselves from the dust and put on our beautiful garments. It is true we are like Israel and Canaan, Canaan is full of enemies, but the Canaanites shall and must be driven out. The whole land from Dan to Beersheba shall be the Lord's. Christian, rejoice. You are soon to be perfect. You are soon to be free from sin, totally without one single evil desire. You are soon to be pure as the angels of light. With the garments of the master, you are to be holy as the holy one. You are to be perfect. No temptation can reach you, and there will be nothing in you that could in any way foster sin. It would be as a spark that falls in the ocean. Your holiness would quench it. Washed in the blood of the Lamb, washed in the blood of Jesus, and baptized with the Holy Spirit, you are soon to walk the golden streets, white-robed and white-hearted too and perfect as your maker. You are to stand before his throne and sing to his praises to eternity. Now, soldiers of Christ, to arms again. Once, once again, rush into the fight. You cannot be defeated. You must overcome. Though you faint a little, yet take courage. You shall conquer through the blood of the Lamb. I shall conclude by making an observation or two. There are some here who say, I am never disturbed in that way. Then I am sorry for you. I will tell you the reason for your false peace. You have not the grace of God in your heart. If you had, you would surely find this conflict within you. Do not despise a Christian because he is in a conflict. Despise yourself because you're out of it. The reason why the devil lets you alone is because he knows you are his. He does not need to trouble you much now. He will have time enough to give you your wages at the last. He troubles a Christian because he is afraid of losing him. He thinks that if he does not tease him here, he shall never have the chance to do it in eternity. That is why the Christian is vexed more than you are. As for you, you may dwell, you may well be without any pain, for dead men feel no blows. You may well be without prickings of conscience, for men that are corrupt are not likely to feel wounds, though you stab them from head to foot. I pity your condition, for the worm that dieth not is preparing to feed upon you. The eternal vulture of remorse shall soon wet its horrid beak with the blood of your soul. Tremble, for the fires of hell are hot and unquenchable, and the place of perdition is hideous beyond the madman's dream. All that you would think of your last end. The Christian may have an evil present, but he has a glorious future. But your future is the blackness of darkness forever. I adjure you by the living God, you that fear not Christ. Consider your ways. You and I must give an account for this morning's service. You are warned. You are warned. Take heed to yourselves. Think not this life to be everything. There is a world to come. There is after death the judgment. If you fear not the Lord, there is after judgment eternal wrath and everlasting misery. And now a word to those who are seeking Christ. Ah, says one, sir, I have sought Christ, but I feel worse than ever I was in life. Before I had no thoughts of Christ, I felt myself to be good. But now I feel myself to be evil. It's all right, my friend. I'm glad to hear you say so. 
When surgeons heal a patient's wound, they always take care to cut away the proud flesh because the cure can never take while the proud flesh remains. The Lord is getting rid of your self-confidence and self-righteousness. He is reveal revealing to you the soul, the deadly cancer, which is festering within you. You are on the road to sure healing if you are on the way to wounding. God wounds before he heals. He strikes a man dead in his own esteem before he makes him alive. Ah, cries one, but can I hope that I ever shall be delivered? Yes, my brother, if you now look to Christ, I care not what your sin nor what your despair of heart. If you will only turn your eye to him who bled upon the tree, there is not only hope for you, but there is certainty, salvation. Look to his blood. Remember that he was triumphant in the blood. From there you can get up humbled but rejoicing, cast down but not in despair, looking for the victory. Jesus Christ came into, into the world to save sinners. Believe that. You are an awakened, conscious, penitent sinner. Therefore, he came to save you. Believe his word. Trust him. Do, not, do nothing for your own salvation of yourself, but trust him to do it. Cast yourself simply and only on him, and as this Bible is true, you shall not find the promise fail you. He that seeketh findeth. Him that knocketh it shall be opened. May God help you by giving you this new life within. May he help you to look to Jesus. And though long and hard be the conflict, sweet shall be the victory. Amen and amen. Lord, thank you for this word. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the light that you give. Thank you, Lord, that though the word was spoken years ago, it is still true, it's still alive, and it will not come back to you void. May that message go out, Lord, and be heard by everyone who needs to hear it. May even in our own family members, our own family, Lord, may they hear the word. May that light come. May they repent and may they be converted and saved in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your truth and your word. Thank you, Lord. And I will add one thing. If you are here today and if you were convicted by this word and if you haven't given your life to Jesus Christ now is the moment and if he's speaking to you and if he's drawing you go ahead and obey and come to him and lift up your hands and open your heart and say Jesus I believe Jesus, save me. Come into my heart. Jesus, baptize me with your Holy Spirit. For he is alive. For he is alive. Amen and amen.